for research at Oklahoma State on limiting water to beef animals this morning. So uh, thanks so much, Megan. Yeah, thanks for having me. Um, hopefully, hopefully this can be heard in the back. So. All right. Uh, first of all, thank you, Liz, for, for having me here today. I'm really excited to be here to tell you a little bit about our USDA project that we've been working on. Oops. Oh, you're fine. There we go. Okay. So if we take a look at, at um, this map here, it really shows the places in the U.S. where there's a lot of available precipitation contrasted with places where there isn't as much. So the very light tan colored areas are those um, where there's really zero to five inches of available precipitation. Um, and if you overlay that with areas where we have a lot of beef cattle in the U.S., those, a lot of those areas where we have dense populations of beef cattle are the same areas where we don't have vast amounts of available precipitation. So our, as you might have guessed from that, our project is really focused around water and water intake in beef cattle. Um, because water is one of those things we really don't tend to think about that much, especially when we think about drought. We tend to think about um, limited forage availability and things like that, but we don't necessarily always stop to think about the fact that we have sometimes very limited water resources available to animals um, when we have a drought. So if you take a look at some of the work in the literature, cattle consume about 760 billion liters of water per year. Um, and that's influenced by a variety of different things, uh, both physiological and environmental. So as you might imagine, size or weight plays a big role in the amount of water cattle consume. And it's also at least somewhat related to the amount of feed that they eat, their dry matter intake. Uh, in terms of the environment, it's definitely influenced by ambient temperature, solar radiation, and probably other environmental factors as well. So one of the things that has been done is um, a group out of Colorado State looked at water intake records for a bunch of animals within the feedlot on a pin basis. So they had 8,000 pin water intake records, which they collected with water meters on those um, water bunks and took a look at um, fitting both performance characteristics, uh, pin feed intakes, um, as well as environmental conditions on those animals. And the model fit, the R squared there was still 0 0.32. Um, so what that indicated to us was, the, was that there's quite a bit of individual animal variation um, in this phenotype. And that might be something that we can tackle with um, both selection and management tools within the beef industry. So if we think about consumptive water use in the industry, if you look at this on something like a, a life cycle assessment, it's not going to have a gigantic impact in terms of total water use within the beef industry because a lot of that comes from uh, pre-harvest water or pre-harvest uh, feed and irrigation of those crops. Um, which also underscores the importance of feed efficiency within the beef industry, um, which is something we are going to have some data to look at as well. Uh, but if we think about water availability during a drought, it is something that's very, very critical to an individual farmer and can have um, big impacts on whether they're able to maintain their herd within a drought scenario. Because typically what we'll see is we may have ponds drying up um, and a, a general lack of water availability. So if we take a look at what we could expect during drought, of course, decreased water availability. Um, and several of the other presenters have referenced this in terms of irrigation, but we also can have decreased water availability for um, consumption of beef cattle out on pasture. We can also have, as you might imagine, as these water sources start to dry up, you can have a decrease in water quality. And to go along with that, a real decrease in palatability. Sometimes it could smell a little bit funny or taste a little funny to them. And that's something um, that at least one study in the literature has shown likely led to a reduction in performance of those animals um, because they didn't want to drink that water. Uh, we could also have increased water temperature if the temperatures are very high and it's a summer drought. Um, which particularly affects taurine cattle. So taurine cattle are the cattle that make up the largest number of animals within the U.S. So these would be your breeds that you commonly hear of, like Angus and Hereford, um, as well as the continental breeds like Charlay, Simital, um, animals like that, in contrast to Bos Indicus-based breeds, which would be your Brahmin-based breeds. 
and they can deal with these things a little bit better than touring cattle, but typically we don't see those animals um, very far north. Um, so all these things kind of come together in a need to consume more water to meet their requirements um, with that increased temperature, but we're probably going to have less water available to them, and it's probably uh, maybe something that they don't really want to drink as much of. So they voluntarily decrease uh, the amount of water that they drink. So we wanted to take a look at uh, water restriction to look at how adaptable animals were to these types of conditions. So we do have a five-year integrated USDA project, and it's integrated between research and extension efforts. So I'll tell you a little bit about both of those things today. Um, but that year, it was really focused around adaptability to abiotic stresses. So we're going to look at um, water availability and quality, and also some work on temperature-related stresses, which I'm not going to be able to uh, tell you about today because we don't have the time. But our goal was really to develop beef cattle selection and management tools that address conservation of water resources and adaptation to climate variability in the form of drought. So our main data site collection site is um, within what we call the Incentech system. So it's got an Incentech feed and water intake system within this barn here out at our uh, research feedlot at Oklahoma State. So each pen has six of these feed bunks here and it has an identical bunk that um, is used to collect individual animal water intake. So basically all of these bunks are, are set on uh, scales and then there's a gate to either allow or disallow access. Um, when we bring them into this facility, as you might imagine with the pneumatic gates going up and down and the new types of bunks, we have to allow them an acclimation period. So when we bring them in, we give them 21 days to learn how to use the facility and access the feed and water. And there will be some that never learn and we have to toss those guys out at that point in time before we really start the test protocol. So once we start that test protocol, they spend 70 days in that facility where we collect baseline feed and water intake. So this is ad libitum feed intake at, uh, during this 70 days. So during the whole project, we're gonna have 840 animals go through this facility. So we do 120 each round for seven different rounds. And uh, I'm not gonna go through every single bit of phenotypic data that we're collecting on these guys just due to time. Um, but you can see we do have water intake to address um, some of our main project goals. We have feed intake, um, which I indicated was important in terms of also reducing um, water footprint. And then we have a variety of weight data, behavioral data, health status, heat stress measures, cold stress measures. And then we're collecting um, a variety of different samples to do some genetic work. So following the 70 day baseline test where we establish every animal's individual um, sort of baseline values for water intake and feed intake, we start a 70 day adaptation test. And that's where that information from the baseline comes into play because we can, with those pneumatic gates, we can restrict the intake of individual animals based on their own baseline intake. So every animal serves as its own control. So we spend 35 days stepping them down by reducing their water intake 10% per week and giving them a week um, for their rumens to kind of catch up with that adjustment until we reach 50%. Once we reach 50%, we give them a week to kind of adjust to those conditions and then we start a 35 day extended water restriction. And we maintain them there during that time and collect the exact same data. So this is again where those animals serve as their own control. So we can compare their performance and their well-being, their health status, and um, those types of measures during this extended water restriction and compare that to all of their own values from that baseline period. Um, during this time, we also take feed samples. They're getting a fairly high roughage feed. Um, so we analyze dry matter on that. We also receive some supplemental funding from Texas Cattle Feeders Association to evaluate the water quality on a monthly basis. So um, we don't anticipate that to change very much just because we're using a city water source in this instance, but um, we are monitoring that in case there are any significant changes. And then once they get done with that test, we spend a couple days stepping them back up to full intake, and then they go to another part of the yard to continue through the finishing phase. So we can take a look at what impacts it may have on their carcass performance. 
Um, and the question I'm sure you're asking right now is, but you don't have any controls <laughs> to compare the carcass performance. So we actually maintain 20 animals um, in pins adjacent to that Incentec facility so that we can see if there are any impacts on carcass performance. We also use those animals as a way to adjust water intake from that baseline if we need to, because if the temperature increases really rapidly after we've started that restriction phase, we need to have some way to evaluate that and, and sort of account for any intake differences that may arise. Thus far, we haven't had to do that. We've been very lucky. And uh, though we weren't funded to do it, um, we're collecting as many tissue samples as we possibly can and flash freezing them at harvest um, so that we may enable ourselves to go back and, and try and get some additional funding to do some RNA sequencing. Okay, so these show just a few very rough sample um, slides related to the animals that were in our very first group. So these animals started last May and they were fed through, I believe, October. Um, and then they went to finishing and we just recently collected the carcass data in January and February. Um, so basically, I just arbitrarily split these animals. There were 117 of them that made it to the end of the intake test. And none of them were removed from the test because um, they weren't able to take the water restriction. Uh, they were removed either due to injuries or, or other types of health reasons. Um, so I arbitrarily split those into three equal groups. So we had based on their water intake. So the low water intake, medium, and high groups. So just arbitrarily split. Um, but if you take a look at their mean water intake across the animals in those groups, we do have significant differences between each of the groups if we take a look at it as a percentage of their body weight. So here, um, this would be an animal, those animals on average drinking about 8.5% of their body weight per day versus these in the high group that would be about 3.5% higher and about 12% of their body weight per day. Um, feed intake, you can see it increases numerically here. We did have one, one significant difference there. Um, but in general, as the water intake, the feed intake increased as well. And I'll show you that data here in a moment. Um, there weren't any differences in average daily gain between those groups in this first group of animals. Now, if we contrast that to their performance during the restriction, we start to see some differences. Um, so one thing I didn't mention uh, earlier, if you take a look at those gates in the systems, as you might imagine, um, it can't kick them out of the system once they've entered it. So when you have to do the restriction, it's not, um, it's not set up to where an animal, once it hits that 50% target, that it, it can eject them from the system. So what you have to do is uh, kind of by trial and error, set those limits to get as close to 50% as possible. Um, so we were able to get pretty close to 50% on all of those groups, uh, but I did want to point this out because we did have a couple significant differences here. Um, and we've taken some additional steps in this second group to really dial that in. And I think we've done a good job of that, but I'm not going to show you that data today. Um, so you can see when, you, when we went to the restriction, the feed intake was reduced the most within the low water intake group. Um, no significant differences, though, uh, when we looked at that. So they also had a very large reduction in average daily gain compared to the other groups. Um, which was a significant difference between uh, the high group here. So the question this really brings to my mind is, if we take a look at those high water intake animals, because they tended to be the less feed efficient in the first group, is it that these high water intake animals are maybe drinking more than they need because it's there and it's available and they can have access to it? Um, so when you go to reduce them, you don't see as big an impacts on their performance. Um, or whether this is an effect that's due to the fact that they are more adaptable. So that's one of the things we're going to have to try and tease out as we move forward. So here's data that just contrasts the feed intake as a percentage of their mid-test body weight versus the water intake also expressed as a percentage of their mid-test body weight. And you can see there is a linear relationship between the two traits, but it's not nearly as strong as I expected it to be uh, based on the work that's in the literature. And just to kind of point out a couple groups here, um, here's one that was eating about a percent and a half of their body weight per day, um, but vast differences in the water intake. So this animal down here was drinking about 6% of his body weight per day. 
and this one up here drinking closer to 14. So some pretty big differences. Um, see the same differences at, at higher levels of feed intake as well. And this is something I was really hoping to see, but I wasn't sure if we were going to, and that is that our uh, average daily gain here on the x-axis doesn't appear to have a very um, large relationship with the water intake of those animals. So that suggests to me that we may be able to make some progress within the water intake of these animals without severely impacting um, their performance. So we have a lot still to come. So I don't want to tell you these results and say they're definitive because we have six more rounds of calves to go still. Um, group two um, is going to be moving to finishing shortly. And uh, we will maintain them there for about 100 days. Um, and then we'll start collecting carcass data on those as well. We're also collecting DNA samples on all of these animals. So um, we'll have 60K genotype data. So we can go and look for um, regions of the genome that are of interest in predicting genetic merit for all of the traits that we collected data on. So both feed intake and water intake, feed efficiency, water, water efficiency, um, adaptability to that stress that we put on them in terms of the water restriction. Um, and one of the big questions is what is the heritability of the trait? Because, um, of course, if it's not heritable, there's nothing we can really do from a genetics perspective. Um, I suspect that it will be because if you look uh, in the literature, laboratory animals show heritabilities of up to 70%, somewhere between 60 and 70. Now, I'd be very, very surprised if we get that high in these ruminant animals. Um, but I'm hoping that we end up with something uh, more like a moderately heritable trait like feed efficiency. But that remains to be seen. Um, also, from the genetic standpoint, we're going to do some metagenomic sequencing. So we have rumen samples and fecal samples collected both right before the water restriction and at the end of the water restriction for every one of these animals. So what we'll do is we'll go select the animals from the tails of both the low and high water intake animals and then those that are the most and least adaptable to those conditions and do some metagenomic sequencing to see if we can identify um, populations in the rumen or later on in the digestive tract that appear to be important um, differentiators between the performance of those animals. Uh, we're going to model greenhouse gas emissions. Wish we could collect them directly, but we don't have the capability to do that at this point in time. Um, but we are collecting the tissues, and, and hopefully we can get a subset of those animals collected um, with some head box units that we do have. We have two of those on campus. Um, so related to the extension outcomes, we really wanted to try and focus on sustainability, um, which for us encompasses both economic, environmental, and social issues. And sort of our, our running definition of sustainability is uh, related to long-term business viability, stewardship of natural resources, and responsibility to community, family, and animals. So for some of these extension outcomes, one of the things we want to do is do some survey work to evaluate consumer perceptions on beef production sustainability and natural resource usage within the industry with a focus on water. Um, and then we're going to build some online educational modules to take any of those topics that we identify um, in those surveys as either being really important to consumers or um, being something that they're not very well informed on to try and educate them. And then we also have some tools that we're going to develop for producers in concert with the Oklahoma Mesonet. So uh, Oklahoma, we're very fortunate in Oklahoma to have a really fantastic Mesonet group. And um, so one of the things we're going to work with them to do is to develop a cattle water demand tool. Um, and I'm not going to promise you exactly what that's looking like because we're still um, talking with them to determine what's feasible to do. Um, but sort of our current idea is that a producer would be able to go in and input characteristics from his herd and to be able to get an idea based on either uh, forecast data or historical climate data what the water needs for his herd may be over a specified period of time. Uh, the other thing we're going to do is uh, work with them to expand the cattle comfort advisor. So this is the Cattle Comfort Advisor from March 22nd. And as you can see, it identifies potential heat stress and cold stress so that producers can take a look at, at this tool several days in advance based on forecast data and um, begin to make some decisions whether they need to make some uh, modifications in management to account for some of these thermal stresses. 
So instead of having that available on a statewide basis, we're going to collect as much uh, data from the National Weather Service, and we've been archiving that for over a year now um, to try and expand that nationwide. So you'd be able to come to the website um, or through the mobile site and pull up a national map. So um, if we take a look at how that fits into um, sustainability, Really, the cattle comfort advisor fits in in a couple of different ways, both in terms of um, economics for producers, as well as um, has some social implications in terms of animal well-being. Uh, to go along with that, that's really where our survey work fits as well. Um, and then our water demand tool fits over in, in terms of um, stewardship of natural resources. So I'm the one up here standing talking to you about this project, um, but it certainly wasn't me who was doing all of the work. Um, so I want to take a minute and just recognize my collaborators, uh, Michelle Cavill Lorenzo, who's taken the lead on the health and the behavioral analysis, um, Sarah Place, who's our um, sustainable beef systems professor, uh, Chris Richards and Clint Crable, which really, uh, they're feedlot nutritionists, so they do a lot of work. Um, with cattle as a feedlot, and Dr. De Silva, who's our metagenomics expert, and then Raluca, who's going to be helping me with the genomics analyses. Uh, we also have DL Step at the vet school. He goes out and monitors the health of those animals for us, and um, of course, Al Sutherland at the Oklahoma Mesonet. Uh, also, we know that uh, the professors in charge of the project aren't the ones doing all of the work either. So I wanted to take a moment and recognize the graduate students in my lab and all their pictures here, um, as well as the other students that have worked on the project. And this is by no means an exhaustive list, but this is the people who've been out there on a daily basis taking all of our respiration rates and monitoring the cattle's well-being and, and um, making sure that they're healthy and, and helping work those animals. So a lot of gratitude to this group right here. And with that, I'll answer any questions that you might have. Yes? Good question. So in the graph, that was all baseline. So in the table where I show differences in average daily gain, that was the same animals, but during the restriction period. So, yeah, yep. Yes. Yeah, lack of water did restrict gain. Uh, just in that baseline period, there didn't appear to be a very strong relationship with, between average daily gain and um, water intake, which surprised me a little bit, but um, I think it will ultimately be a good thing. Yes, sir. That's a good question and no. Um, so because of the metagenomic sequencing that we're doing, the diet has to be exactly the same on all of those animals. So we're not able to test any differences in the diet. And then uh, none of those animals are cannulated. So that affects our ability to do some of that work. But that, that would be nice to have, definitely. Because um, there are some differences in digestibility when we start to talk about restricting water um, in those animals. Yes, ma'am. Um, what's the main outcome coming from this? Is it has to do with the um, genetics of the uh, animals that are selected, or does it have to do with how water is managed? It, it's more related to the performance of those animals. So first, understanding the relationship between water intake and other performance indicators in those animals, whether it's feed intake, um, feed efficiency, growth, those types of traits. Um, and then also to try and understand what genes may be controlling this, to start down um, the path of either through understanding what those relationships are with other traits, we may be able to inform some of the selection decisions using products and tools that are already available in the industry, or to use genomics to develop new selection tools, um, which is probably a longer term type goal. Um, but there is tremendous potential with the adoption of that technology in the industry to start to take some of these novel traits and, and make some selection progress in them. Yes. Um, I hope that it will. So one of the things I discussed earlier um, was, and 
there's probably some people in the audience that know more about this than I do, but if we take a look at water use from a life cycle assessment standpoint, the majority of that is gonna be from feed production. Um, so it's probably not gonna be as important looking at total water footprint of the industry, although there would be some improvements we could make looking at a uh, three and a half percent difference between the low group and the high group. That's a lot of water if you multiply that out um, on an animal's lifetime, especially a cow. Um, but I think uh, where it really is critical is for, in terms of consumption of water, it's critical for an individual farmer um, who's trying to manage a pond water source or something like that versus um, on a whole industry perspective. But certainly um, could maybe have a small impact. Sure. That's a good question. Um, so I think one, one way to look at that is really where a lot of our water use is gonna be is probably within the cow herd. And unfortunately, it's very difficult to get somebody in here and put their cow herd in there and, and restrict water on their cow herd and, and potentially impact performance in that manner. So we're forced to do that on steers. Um, but I think that's where genetics can really play a role because I don't think we would expect the genes to be any different in those feedlot animals versus the cow herd. So I think that's where we could really have um, a big impact in terms of extrapolating those results widely. Um, but certainly the animals we're getting aren't any kind of special animals, um, which is kind of a negative from the genetic standpoint, but it's a real positive in terms of um, looking at whether the results are really applicable across the industry, because these are typical animals that you could go out and buy at a cell barn. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you bet, thank you.